people think that the federal government has any power except things that are expressly prohibited. And it's actually the other way around. Tell me a little bit about something that we don't know about the Constitution that we should know. The first thing that left to my mind was people think that the federal government has any power except things that are expressly prohibited. And it's actually the other way around. The federal government only has the power that the Constitution expressly gives to it. Mm -hmm. Everything else is reserved to the states or the people. And if you think about that, that's a really important distinction. The federal government can only do what the Constitution explicitly says, yes, you may do this. And the federal government has grown so out of bounds that it's, you know, it's doing the opposite. Every day it does the opposite. Yeah, well, it seems that that's how we're governed now, that almost mm -hmm. everything is through the federal government, and especially if you listen to the Democratic candidates now, that they seem to want to do all of these things regardless of what states want and, and things like that. How do they get away with it? I don't mean to make this even partisan, in general yeah. speaking. I would say both know. parties do yeah. it. I, I, um, I, don't, I think it starts with us, honestly, because think about anything that's happening. If, you, if a natural disaster hits, tornado in Dallas, <laughs> yeah. people, hopefully in Texas a little bit less as a Texas girl, yeah. <laughs> but um, we look to the government and we, look, we don't look to even to the state government, we look to the federal government. We want our, our governor to declare a state emergency because then we know there's more federal funds, there's more this, there's more that. I, I think the mindsets of ever, everybody has changed so badly that we're enabling the situation to continue. Um, so maybe we can start at home by, look, I'm, you know, I'm from Dallas. I'm, I hope we all, we're pitching in, we're helping our neighbors, we're hopefully looking to our state or our city before we start looking to the federal government. I think that if we can work on that, that's a really big problem I just outlined. Yeah. <laughs> but um, Well, are you shocked at sort of how little it seems people know or, or care about our founding documents? I mean, I talk about them here all the time. The, the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence are sitting on right. the wall in my control room right over there. But that so few people actually really think about the documents that led to the unprecedented freedom that we're living in right now. We live in a world that has created that. We have schools that teach social studies when they used to teach history. Mm -hmm. or when, you know, we don't teach the Federalist Papers, which of course were the, and the Anti-Federalist Papers, which were the arguments back and forth at the time of the founding about the Constitution and why it exists as it does and what, what they were trying to create. We just, we don't do any of this stuff in our schools anymore. And then we have adults that grow up having never been exposed to this and, and so nobody knows, literally yeah. nobody knows. And I think the founding generation, if you read in the Federalist Papers, especially over and over and over again, James Madison or Alexander Hamilton will say, the people will keep this in line. Mm -hmm. they, and they talk about the people as if we will be educated, as if we will know, as if we will take all of this into consideration when we're voting and doing all the things that we do. But once you undermine education and once that's gone, how can you possibly keep this structure in place anymore? Do you think that was a miscalculation by the founders that over time sort of that the state would kind of slowly grow and then as it grew that education would kind of get worse and maybe they couldn't envision yeah. all of that but that that was their miscalculation that the people would somehow always be engaged? Yes, I do, they knew, they assumed the people would be engaged. You read it over and over again. They also assumed we would always be more loyal to our states than to the federal government which probably, by the way, comes with the education. <laughs> when you lose yeah. the education, you lose the loyalty to your states because you stop understanding why it's so important, why that's an important part of the check system of checks and balances. Yeah. We talk about the executive and the judiciary and the legislative and how they work against and, and with each other and how they check and balance each other, but also the state and the federal government were supposed to be checks on each other. And that doesn't mean states always handle things correctly, just like the federal government doesn't handle things correctly. But it's all a part of the process. We assume that everybody's gonna make mistakes. We assume that the, the system, where there are so many competing powers going head to head all the time, that that will in the end protect us because everything will be, it will be difficult to push anything through too quickly and in the, the heat of the moment, emotionally. And, and isn't that sort of the bizarre situation we're in where now it's like we've had this incredible system where the states could tinker and figure out what they wanted to do with taxes mm -hmm. and education and gay marriage and marijuana legalization mm -hmm. and literally every topic there is. Um, but now we're outsourcing all of that. And it's like, well, now if the government does some bad stuff, it's not that you can leave your state because the next state's gonna be the same. You gotta leave the country. Right, that's not good. That's not good. 
I mean, when you were talking about that, I was thinking there's so many examples from our history where Wyoming, for instance, was the very first state to let women vote. They did it in 1892, way before anybody else, because they thought it was a good idea. The reason was funny. They wanted pi more pioneers, women, to come huh. out and to join all the men because huh. there were too many men and they needed women. But states used to operate for themselves with their own interest in mind and they made decisions on all sorts of topics. And we don't even consider that anymore. So we're here, here, we're here in California, which yeah. is probably doing most of that yeah. wrong, and we have an ever-expanding government, and we now have a, you know, this progressive uh, Governor Newsom, but you're in Texas. What, what are some of the things that you think maybe Texas, which is still a little more Texas, yeah. uh, <laughs> that Texas might be doing right that maybe California is doing wrong? I mean, I love my state. We're not perfect, so I can also list things we're doing wrong. Sure. But, um, All right, well, let's do both then. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, you can't buy a Tesla straight from, from the, you have to go through all these hoops because of the automobile lobby, from what I understand. Mm -hmm. um, there, are, there are things that I think are not great, but mostly what we do is we regulate less. You know, if you want to use a straw, use a straw. If you don't want to use a straw, don't use a straw. It's so funny you say I that because I, I was telling you, I was just in Dallas this past weekend and you guys still have plastic straws. We like them. And I was I in like New York them. a couple of days before drinking yeah. out of this soggy straw and I'm like, this is horrible. I Ugh. know. So, but look, there's arguments for and against it, whatever. I'm not trying to diss anybody's opinion on that, but it just, in Texas, I think we are probably more likely, not uniformly, but more likely to say, make your own decision, we have fewer taxes, which I consider a great thing, you know, there's no income tax, but um, we do have property taxes, but you choose to buy a house and then you pay the property tax when you choose to buy the house. I hope that we're a little bit more free down there just to kind of make up our own minds, but um, I think the founders would have liked that. They, they definitely would so, have liked that. So, yeah. so right now we're seeing what I think are major assaults, particularly on the First Amendment, so we'll, we'll start with that, particularly on, on free speech. Now, people are very confused about encroachments on free speech relative to the government versus just sort of mob rule that we see all the time. Are you, uh, well, do you agree with me that free speech really is in, in a tenuous state that maybe it hasn't been, uh, say, the last couple of decades? Yeah, I do. I, it's, it's, yeah, I, I think we kind of went from a place where there were, a whole bunch of things that we were trying to become more tolerant of. And then we got to the place where we were more tolerant of a whole bunch of stuff. And now we're at a place where we're on the other side where now you're no longer to even say things that were the norm 20 or 30 years ago. It's like yeah. it flipped on it. It's, it's, it's very weird to me. And I, there's certain things that I think you just, you can't say without all sorts of <laughs> bad things coming down on your head. If you had to sort of grade the way the system's kind of functioning right now. Oh, we're broken. We're broken. I've been saying that for a while, and um, we're just, we're broken. I, I do think, um, we're talking about the Electoral College a little bit, I think yeah. that is one thing that will help. I do think we've been broken before, and we've come out of it. Um, we were broken in the years after the Civil War. It was a big mess then. Mm -hmm. We had multiple elections where, you know, the electoral vote and the popular vote did not match up, mm -hmm. and there were two elections where the recorded national popular vote winner did not win the election. There was year after year where the electoral map looked really, really similar, very closely divided. The red areas always seem to be red and the blue areas mm -hmm. always seem to be blue, which is what we're doing now. And um, eventually, because of the Electoral College, we came out of that, is my belief, because if you think about it, if you're a Democrat in the South in those years, you cannot win the White House at all, period, mm -hmm. because you don't have enough electoral votes in your safe areas. But if you are a Republican, you kind of have the opposite problem where you have enough in the North and Northwest, which is where it generally was, to win, but kind of just barely. And if mm -hmm. the Democrats make any inroads at all, you're gonna lose. So both sides over time had to reach out to the other side and listen and figure it out. And so that's why I, I, I think we're there now. I do think that's what's happening. But I also have hope that this, because of the structure of the system, even though we're not educated enough about it, yeah. <laughs> that we will come back to a better place where we, we just have to figure it out. All right, so before we do yes. the full dive on Sorry. Electoral College, yes. which we'll, we'll spend the rest of the conversation talking about because I really, really want people to understand why the founders started this idea and why it actually mm -hmm. is the right idea and all that. Um, but in terms of the system working or not working at the moment, do you think part of it is just that the way we operate, that, that the presidency, the cult of personality around the presidency 
is such that people think that it's the president's job to do everything. So they, if you if you like Trump, you kind of think, oh, he should just do whatever he wants and executive actions are right. okay. The same time when Obama was for it, you probably weren't right. for executive actions. Right. Or right now, listening to the candidates, you know, the, everything that they want to do, they don't realize they're actually not the ones that are supposed to write the laws. They're just supposed to sign right. the laws. Do you think that that's just a cult of personality issue that we just pick one person, almost like we yearn for a king in like some really perverse sense or something like that. So to really get geeky on you, it goes, Let's all, get geeky. The way Let's back go. To, it goes yeah. all the way back to the 17th Amendment, which of course changed the way that we elect United States senators. And it used to be that state legislators would pick those. And now of course we have a popular election, right. just like anybody else, which makes senators more like the House of Representatives, which is not what they were supposed to be. They were supposed to actually represent the state right. as a state. In the, in the Congress so that the laws and the process and all of the stuff that was happening in Congress would reflect the interest not only of the people from the House side, but also the state legislatures, which are expected, of course, to be an important check and balance on the national government. Well, unsurprisingly, when we turned the Senate into something more like the House, we, we lost a check and now it's, the Congress has just become a place to try to get the people as much as we feel like we want, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, whether it's good for the country, whether it's good for the state or not. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics instead of nonstop yelling, check out our politics playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.